Welcome to Module 9. This is the ninth and final installment in the Emerging Infectious Disease videos for pre-hospital providers series. In this video, we will be discussing the transfer of patient care for patients with Ebola and other highly infectious diseases and give an introduction to biocontainment units. This instructional series was created by the University of Maryland Baltimore County Department of Emergency Health Services with assistance from the Maryland Department of Health the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems, and funding from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In this module, we will discuss the tiered approach to Ebola virus disease hospital preparedness as defined by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We will review the principles of field transport and transfer of care and explore the considerations for designated transport units. Finally, this video will provide an introduction to biocontainment units and the unique features that equip them to care for patients with known or suspected highly infectious diseases. The CDC has developed a tiered strategy to prepare U.S. healthcare facilities and healthcare workers to safely and rapidly identify, isolate, evaluate, manage, and potentially transfer persons under investigation for Ebola and other highly infectious diseases. This strategy identifies which hospitals will provide varying levels of care for patients being assessed and treated for highly infectious diseases. The first tier is frontline healthcare facilities. The second tier is Ebola and special pathogen assessment hospitals. And the third tier is Ebola and special pathogen treatment centers. In some cases, a hospital will serve in more than one role in the tiered approach. It is important to note that all hospitals, regardless of their designated tier, must be prepared to appropriately train their staff in safe PPE practices, adhere to infection control protocols, and implement systems to safely manage waste disposal, cleaning, and disinfection. Frontline healthcare facilities include most of the acute care facilities in the United States that are equipped for emergency care. In general, EMS should transport stable patients under investigation to an Ebola and special pathogen assessment hospital rather than to a frontline facility. Patients may be temporarily referred to a frontline healthcare facility when it is not feasible to refer to other designated facilities based on distance, bed availability, or other. Frontline healthcare facilities should be prepared to rapidly identify and isolate patients with possible Ebola virus disease, promptly notify facility infection control and public health agencies, quickly transfer patients to an Ebola and special pathogen assessment hospital or treatment center as recommended by state and local public health officials. These facilities should also have enough Ebola PPE for at least 12 to 24 hours of care and be prepared to transfer the patient to an Ebola and special pathogen assessment hospital. Ebola and other special pathogen assessment hospitals are facilities that are prepared to receive and isolate a person under investigation and provide care to that patient until a diagnosis of Ebola can be confirmed or ruled out and until discharge or transfer is completed. Ebola and other special pathogen assessment hospitals will safely receive and isolate a patient under investigation for Ebola, will provide immediate laboratory evaluation and coordinate Ebola testing, and will be capable of caring for the patient for up to five days until an Ebola diagnosis is confirmed or ruled out. These facilities will have enough Ebola PPE to last for up to five days of care. If a patient is found to have confirmed Ebola, the Ebola and other special pathogen assessment hospital will initiate and coordinate the transfer to an Ebola and other special pathogen treatment center. Ebola and other special pathogen treatment centers are facilities which are prepared to provide comprehensive care to persons diagnosed with Ebola for the duration of their illness. These hospitals have been assessed by the CDC for Ebola virus disease readiness and are prepared to provide patient care using the necessary Ebola PPE for the duration of the patient's illness. Ebola and other special pathogen treatment centers will safely receive and isolate a patient with confirmed Ebola, will care for a patient with Ebola for the duration of the illness, and will have a sustainable staffing plan to manage several weeks of care. These facilities must have enough PPE for at least seven days of care and will restock as needed. Regional Ebola and other special pathogen treatment centers meet the requirements for Ebola treatment centers and have additional enhanced capabilities 
to treat a patient with confirmed Ebola or other highly infectious diseases. These hospitals and their associated health departments are a part of the national network of 55 Ebola and other special pathogen treatment centers. They are continuously ready and available to care for a patient with Ebola or another severe, highly infectious disease, regardless of whether the patient is medically evacuated from overseas or is diagnosed in the United States. Here you can see the Maryland Ebola Hospital Tier designations. The Johns Hopkins Hospital is both the Regional Ebola and Other Special Pathogen Treatment Center, as well as a Local Ebola and Other Special Pathogen Treatment Center. The University of Maryland Medical Center is the second Ebola and Other Special Pathogen Treatment Center in the state. The hospitals in Maryland that have been designated as assessment centers include Anne Arundel Medical Center, Frederick Memorial Hospital, Holy Cross Hospital of Silver Spring, Peninsula Regional Medical Center, and MedStar Southern Maryland Hospital Center. All other acute hospital care centers across the state function as frontline healthcare facilities. In this next section, we will discuss the principles of transporting patients and transfer of care from the field to a hospital setting. The first EMS unit to arrive on scene is called the first arriving unit. Designated transport units are specially trained personnel and ambulances specifically designed and supplied for patients with highly infectious diseases such as Ebola, novel influenza, avian influenza, multidrug resistant TB, SARS, and MERS. First arriving units should have their local Ebola virus disease response plan available. The initial steps involve the first arriving unit notifying a supervisor and establishing incident command. Providers or dispatch should notify the responsible parties for patient care, including the receiving facility, the transporting ambulance agency, the public health authority, the emergency management agency, the hazardous material agency, and law enforcement. Providers should discuss methods of communication as radio frequencies may be monitored by the public. Providers or incident command should perform the following tasks. Confirm that the transporting ambulance personnel and receiving facility personnel have appropriate PPE. Confirm the location for the transfer of patient care with the receiving facility as this location will be chosen to minimize exposure. Communicate and confirm the location for donning and doffing of PPE for designated transport unit personnel and ambulance decontamination and disinfection. In some jurisdictions, a specialized ambulance and team called a designated transport unit may be available to transport the patient under investigation from the field to the receiving facility. Providers should determine if ALS or BLS care is needed for transportation, keeping in mind that procedures requiring sharps should be limited during transport. The first arriving unit must also communicate to the designated transport unit whether the patient is ambulatory or requires a stretcher for transport. As mutually agreed upon with the designated transport unit, the first arriving unit should have the patient apply barrier garments, such as a footed suit, surgical mask, and gloves as available. In addition, the first arriving unit should assume that all patient property is contaminated, transfer patient care and any belongings to the transport team, provide the patient care report in an electronic format if available, and follow their jurisdiction's standard operating procedures for call completion, doffing of PPE, and disinfection of exposed environmental surfaces and personnel. Designated transport unit providers should ensure transportation readiness by performing the following actions. Confirm that the receiving facility is ready for patient arrival. Confirm the location for decontamination and disinfection of the ambulance and doffing of PPE for ambulance transport personnel. Confirm the hospital is prepared to manage contaminated waste, and if used in their jurisdiction, ensure procedures, such as ambulance wrapping, have been implemented to limit the contamination of ambulance environmental surfaces. Incident Command, or the designated transport unit, should ensure adequate inventory of supplies, including appropriately sized PPE, Ambulance wrapping supplies such as barrier drapes and tape for the transport vehicle 
as indicated in the jurisdictional protocols, backup PPE for possible breaches, additional charged batteries if using a PAPR, supplies for decontamination and disinfection, and supplies for waste collection. The designated transport unit or incident command must also ensure that appropriate medical direction is immediately available throughout the transport. Prior to transporting a patient under investigation for Ebola or another highly infectious disease, a mission briefing may be held which should cover a transport provider health check, patient history and condition, team member roles and responsibilities, including supervision of donning and doffing procedures, relevant clinical care guidelines, including the appropriateness of interventions or invasive procedures, appropriate transfer of paper or electronic patient care records in a way that avoids contamination, and decontamination and disinfection procedures. During transport, the providers on the designated transport unit may communicate with the designated point of contact at the receiving facility, observe donning of PPE, and when ready, proceed to make patient contact, conduct a brief patient assessment to determine the patient's stability and the presence of wet symptoms such as vomiting or diarrhea, and perform only necessary patient assessment and treatments to minimize patient contact. Providers in the designated transport unit may also transport the patient in an impervious suit or isopod per their jurisdictional protocols. Providers should consider any patient belongings to be contaminated. Patient belongings are typically bagged, labeled, and transported with the patient in the patient compartment. When in doubt regarding paper patient care reports and documents, consider them contaminated and appropriately package them for transport. Upon arrival at the receiving facility, providers in a designated transport unit should confirm arrival with the receiving facility and the specific route of travel within the facility before exiting the ambulance with the patient, Transport the patient to the designated location in the receiving facility through the most direct route to the isolation unit, which is often marked by security personnel. Transfer patient care to the receiving facility team. Return to the ambulance and proceed to the designated decontamination and doffing areas. And disinfect the ambulance per their jurisdictional protocols. The receiving facility should be prepared to do the following tasks for the arrival of a patient under investigation for a highly infectious disease. Ensure the isolation unit is ready to receive the patient. Prepare and confirm the arrival site, the route of entry to the isolation unit, and the location of patient transfer. Confirm the location for ambulance decontamination and personnel doffing of PPE. Consider the need for security on the route of patient transport through the facility. Prepare to receive biohazard waste from the transporting ambulance agency. Inform the appropriate public health, emergency management, and public safety authorities of the arrival of the patient. And communicate any diagnostic test results to the transporting ambulance agency as appropriate to inform them of the need for continuing post-mission surveillance. Biocontainment units are specialized facilities designed to care for patients with highly infectious diseases such as Ebola. These facilities are designed to provide high-level isolation capabilities and are equipped with unique features that enable them to contain and treat highly infectious diseases that spread through contact, droplet, or airborne transmission methods. These units are capable of containing and treating pathogens such as smallpox, plague, viral hemorrhagic fevers, botulism, tularemia, anthrax, SARS, MERS, avian influenza, novel influenza, monkeypox, multidrug resistant TB, and extensively drug resistant TB. In the next section, we will review some of the special characteristics of biocontainment units that enable them to care for patients with highly infectious diseases. Though each unit is specifically designed to meet the needs of the individual facility, there are some common characteristics that can be found in each biocontainment unit. In general, biocontainment units will be located away from other clinical units and have secure entry and exit points to minimize cross-contamination. 
The units are designed so that they allow for one-way flow of providers and materials through patient care areas. Moving from the clean staff areas and PPE donning rooms to the patient areas to the doffing rooms. Once appropriate doffing and decontamination have been performed, providers can exit the doffing rooms back to the cleaned areas. Additionally, the units are equipped with advanced air handling systems that use a negative pressure design and high efficiency particulate air or HEPA filters. The negative pressure design keeps clean air flowing in from the hallways into the anteroom, from the anteroom into the patient's rooms, and then out through the HEPA filters. This prevents air, along with potentially infectious particles, from escaping out into the rest of the hospital. All biocontainment units are staffed with teams of highly trained and highly skilled nurses and clinicians. These teams often have adult, pediatric, and obstetric capabilities, among others. Healthcare workers who staff biocontainment units must also be able to perform advanced critical care skills while maintaining strict adherence to infection control procedures. To minimize the transport of infectious materials out of the units, biocontainment units are typically equipped with their own on-site diagnostic laboratory, on-site imaging, and an autoclave waste management system that can sterilize equipment leaving the unit with high-pressure steam. Advanced telecommunication systems allow other providers and family members to remotely interact with patients and staff, reducing the risk of spreading a highly infectious disease. These are just some of the common characteristics of biocontainment units that make them uniquely capable of providing care to patients with highly infectious diseases. For your reference, additional information on biocontainment units can be found in the resources below this video. Thank you for joining us for the ninth and final installment in the Emerging Infectious Disease videos for pre-hospital provider series. We hope that this series has increased your knowledge of both common and highly infectious diseases and provided information which you may use to protect yourself, your families, and your patients. Additional information may be found in the reference section on the website as well as below this video. We wish you the best in the field and in your practice.